everyone, and welcome to Reflections, a 2020 A Year in Review. I'm honored to have been included on this presentation. And what I decided to bring to you tonight is a topic that I've spoken a lot about during the whole year, actually, as I've been doing Stock Charts TV. And that is something that began to trend, particularly this year, and will continue to trend, in my opinion, into 2021, and that's food and soft commodities. So essentially, we came into this year with a 100-year low ratio between equities and commodities. And in commodities, I mean more than just the food. We also had that as far as copper and steel. And that ratio has flipped, in essence. It's still a huge spread between equities, or the SPY, if we're going to use that as a benchmark, and commodities. But it has come in, which tells me that the trend has reversed. And in some ways only getting started. So what I wanted to show you here is a chart. This is a, a composite chart. Uh, this is Goldman Sachs, and it's a commodity index chart. And what I thought this was really interesting is we went back here five years to 2015. And if you just look at the little burb on the bottom, it tells you that it's more than just food. It's energy products, industrial metals, agricultural products, livestock products, and precious metals. So that means that it's a combination of everything, though, with energy actually being the highest percentage in terms of its exposure. Now, why that's interesting to me is that there have been, besides food, there's been a tremendous lag in energy commodities as well, until very recently, as we're starting to see the energy sector catch up big time, which is exactly the opposite of what every analyst under the sun basically has said there, is that oil and energy is dead and we're just going to clean energy, but we are still very much an oil and gas economy. But what's interesting to me, if we step back, is with food included in that, and of course the huge run we've seen lately in platinum and copper and in steel, that this is also showing in general what could happen here when commodities starts to heat up. Now, if you look at this chart, what you can see here on this chart is that we have this line here. If you go back to 2015, it comes in right here, right? If we go across, we broke down in 2019, and now here we are right at this resistance point, and this, date is, this chart is right up to date. So that means that we're into some resistance here. I find that to be good news, because what that tells me is that if we see any kind of dip in any of these commodities, and precious metals are a part of this, but they've been certainly lagging behind everything else, that could be a buy opportunity, or we could do a momentum type play, which I talk about a lot with real motion. And we could say that if it takes out this resistance after being down for over four years below it, that means that we could see an explosion. Now, this next chart is interesting here because this goes back to 2005. And this is just, again, a general chart of industrial commodities. And we're going to focus on food, but it's all sort of connected because when I was down on the floor in the commodities exchange back in that late 70s, early 80s, pretty much when inflation takes a grip, it takes a grip across all raw materials, which become in demand. So this chart to me is very interesting because the red is the SPY and the blue is the Commodity Raw Industrial Spot Index. And even though you can see the huge outperformance still by the SPY, you can see during going periods of time, now this doesn't go back here to 1980, but during periods of time where you had the commodities explosion here right before we had the mortgage debacle, outperforming the SPY, then again here in 2010, 2011, and this is when the interest rates started really coming down. Uh, and then, of course, we went into to more of a deflationary period. And that's kind of where people are still talking that we're in this deflationary period, this dip here being, of course, right at the heart of the pandemic. So we're coming out of a deflationary period. If we just look at this as a chart, we sort of have a double bottom here. And what we could see is as this climbs, if the dollar continues to drop or the rates have to start rising and we start to see this come down, that's another clue that inflation is coming. Now, if we go specifically to the crop prices here, what I want to show you is that this is data as of November 13th, so it's not old at all. This is what has happened to crop prices over the last three months. So you can see that wheat has gone up almost 33%. 
that corn has gone up almost 32%, soybeans 31.5%, and the soft red winter wheat a little bit less, but still up 20.7%. Now, if you just look at the crop prices versus what the market has done over the last month, that will show you that the, these crop prices have actually really soared in comparison to equities. We're just not seeing that yet, obviously, in the statistics I just showed you. And there are many reasons why this is happening. Part is that we've had a very bad supply chain because of COVID. Part is because we've had a low labor force because of COVID. Part of it is because of things that are going on with the climate, which I'm going to show you in a moment. And part of it is because farmers in particular over the last several years with a surplus started to plant less. And also you're getting into a changing psychology with China in particular that needs a tremendous amount of food, starting to hoard some of these raw materials. And even though they're trying very hard to genetically create this in a lab, which they've just been able to do, by the way, with chicken, which I don't know if I'd be the first one to line up for that. It's going to be really hard to, to grow food artificially at this point. Now, this is exactly what I'm talking about. This is a chart of the vegetable health index. Yeah, there is one. And this takes place in Brazil. So what you see here is the red is the crop land exact, uh, and the blue, which I guess this is supposed to be blue here, is the land itself. So what we're seeing right now is if we go back to 2010, we had an issue with the cropland. And remember, I showed you the chart earlier that showed that during 2010 through 2011, we had a little bit of an explosion of commodities to equities. And then here, it's showing just the opposite, that the health of the cropland was great. So this whole period that we've seen a dip in all of these crop prices relates to the fact that we've had these great conditions <clears throat> environmentally, particularly in Brazil, that grows so many of these crop commodities. And then we kind of fell down a little bit. We have had great conditions, great conditions, fell a little bit. Again, great conditions until what we're seeing right here in 2020. And I'm going to show you another picture of that. But Brazil is definitely having problems with drought, not just Brazil, but Argentina as well. Okay, so this is something that appeared in the Wall Street Journal, and it's a map of what the impact of what they're expecting coming into 2021 is, which is La Nina, sort of the bad sister of El Nino. So on this side, we have Australia, and on this side, we have the U.S., and then down here, we have Brazil. So basically, what we're seeing is this, that the uh, blue here is showing wetter conditions, the green here is showing drier conditions, and the yellow is showing colder conditions. So essentially what we have going on right now is that if we look at Canada and the US, as they're looking at a colder winter, that could help natural gas, which is interesting, by the way, because natural gas has been extremely cheap. With a higher rainfall in Australia, that could actually be a help to the cattle and sheep. But the lower rainfall that we're going to have in the United States could hit crop production, while the drier weather in Argentina, which is down here in Brazil, can certainly reduce the soybean yields. What we're seeing exactly with La Nina, the last time it happened was in 2011. And just a couple of minutes ago, I showed you the slide of how the food prices soared in 2011. Okay, so now let's go to a few charts because I want to give you actionable information on this theme that we've seen emerge and why you can see that I'm so excited about what's going to happen uh, as we get into 2021 in terms of investment opportunities. So this is DBA. This is sort of the biggie in terms of the agricultural ETF. I've certainly pointed this out to you throughout the year before. And I'm going to show you two views of everything. This is the daily view where we can look at the momentum and the uh, performance indicators, and then I'll show you a weekly chart to give you some history. So if we look at this right now, let's start actually with the weekly chart. With the weekly chart, if we're going back here quite some time, we're looking at this going back to that big spike that we told you about in 2011. And we've really been in a downtrend ever since until we started bottoming out here with COVID and demand rising and the climate change issues that we've seen as this started to bottom out. What's interesting is that we have a gap here, we stopped at 570 on, this, on these levels. So right now, exactly from a technical standpoint, this resistance is something we can do one of two things with. 
just kind of like what I showed you in that chart earlier or on the overall commodity index. We could either wait for this to clear 1570 and say, okay, it's clear the resistance, it's about to make another leg higher, in which case I think we can easily get up past the 17, maybe look closer to 18 or 19 level in this, and that's if things don't get crazy out of control. Or we have a buy opportunity potentially happening right now as we're starting to see a correction. And that's where I want to take you back to the daily chart. The 50-day moving average is at 1498. If we can get a dip, and that's not too far from here, about another 20 to 30 cents lower. If we can see a dip down closer to 15, and what is creating this dip right now is not any change in the climate that we just talked about, but really more interest rates as the yields have actually been rising over the last few days, even with the dollar coming down. That dip could also be a gift because you would know right away if it breaks down under the 50-day moving average, you're wrong. I like that. I like to know that I'm in, I probe. If it breaks, I'm gone. I probe again if it clears it. Or if you're more of a momentum trader, as I said, you can wait for this to take out that 1570. In which case, then you would have to find a better risk. And I would say, really, your risk would have to be somewhere around this 1520 level. Now. If you take a look at the leadership, obviously you can see it doesn't have any leadership at this point, but if you take a look at the momentum in the real motion, even though it's come off, there's no real divergence, it's coming down into support. So the next chart I wanna show you is a very interesting chart, it's PBJ. And PBJ actually represents both beverages and food. And again, this is a weekly chart here. Um, and this concludes Pepsi, Monster Beverage, Brown Furman, Hershey, General Mills Craft, Boston Beer. This is an interesting chart because it's not just focused on the crops, but it kind of shows you what could happen to these companies and their food prices go up to a point that means they make more money until people can't afford. But we're so far from that at this point. People need food and they'll always buy food and they'll pay up for food. There may be more luxury items they give up, but as we know, their Coca-Cola, their cereal, their chocolate, these are things that people don't give up, generally speaking, and certainly not if times are hard. So what we have here right now is a situation where it's coming to its actual all-time high. And you can see that even the more recent high. So this area has still been a hot space. Now let's take a look to the daily here. And in the daily, you can see this even more clearly in that we are about to take out this high here at 35.10. In fact, it's trading at 35.11 as I'm recording this. However, we haven't even begun to outperform the benchmark here, so it's not showing any market leadership, which is pretty extraordinary when all you think about what this chart looks like. But the momentum is very, very good as well. So essentially now, we have to say that if it really has a close, and especially a weekly close up above these levels that we're seeing right here, which is really like 35.10 to 35.15, that is a new high close. Momentum traders should applaud that and celebrate it by buying it with maybe a tighter stop under the slow right here that I'm showing, like let's say under 34.50. So you can see where right now we're feeling it in the grocery stores where when they say there's no inflation, a lot of people go, obviously they're not counting what we're counting. Now the next one I wanna talk about is pure food. It's such an interesting little chart. This is FUD. And FUD, look at that. We had this incredible spike. And this was right after the pandemic was ha over, or when I say over, perceived to be at least retreating. Of course, we've had other waves since that. And here's that hoarding of the food that we saw going on. So this ETN, by the way, this is an ETN, which means it's an index that tracks futures, not necessarily stocks. And so you could see this huge spike here. And now this has come all the way back down close to the 200 week moving average. So this 17 area should be watched very carefully. If we take a look at what this looks like on a daily chart, we'll get a more finite picture. And here 
we're well underperforming. Our momentum has broken down under the 50. It's not a divergence because our price is broken down under the 50. It's over the 200 and our price is over the 200. But that 17 is where you see it more clearly on the weekly chart because that weekly moving average is coming in. And that's why it's always helpful, especially when you're looking out, to look at multiple time frames. So I would be keeping an eye on this one as well. If it holds around that 17 level and starts to move back up, I'm not saying I would necessarily trade this particular ETN. You could, but it would certainly give you a clue, especially if we get back over this 50-day moving average, that things are moving up again. So the next chart, we're going to go right to corn. Let's go to the weekly first. Okay, so here we have the corn chart. Now corn, remember, has already gone up. What we're seeing here, over 30%, right, from the bottom. So that's a big move off the bottom. The question is, will it sustain? So if we're looking at this on the weekly chart, again, huge downtrend since we had that big move up in 2011 and then again in 2014 area. So we're talking about a major trend reversal. These are the things that I get most excited about because your opportunities are incredible. You don't necessarily want to chase, but you certainly have opportunities on every correction. And that's what we're getting right now. So we are actually long corn futures and we have been, well, through the ETF at, since 1344. And we've actually taken a little profit here and we, of course, will have a no-loss stop. But on a weekly chart, if we even got stopped out at our no-loss stop or break-even stop, we would have another opportunity as it got closer to the 50. And if it doesn't, and it starts to clear these levels right here, we're interested. So let's take a look at possibly adding back to our position. So let's take a look at this again on a daily chart. And you can see it a bit clearer here. Here's our stop is under here. Obviously, if it breaks the 50, we don't want to lose money on our second half that we took the profit up here. However, if it doesn't break the 50, and even if it holds these levels that we're seeing now, which would really be a level closer to like 1380, then to me, what that means is that this thing is going to hold. And if it can take out 1417, this 10 week, 10 day moving average, that could be interesting. What we want to see though, again, no leadership yet. None of these, they had shown leadership. If you go back, leadership here, when we were back in March, a little bit of leadership kind of fake outs here. If we go back here to September, October, it looked like this thing was just going to keep exploding. Actually, the leadership started to die, and it's been up and down, up and down. So you also want to see this not only show leadership against the benchmark, but you want to see it actually start to take out all the resistance from all of this here. And the momentum has come off, but certainly not with any divergence. So again, corn is something I would be really interested in. Next one, and remember, we just saw that soybeans could be greatly impacted by La Nina. We had a trade in soybeans. We're out of it right now, but we're looking for another opportunity. Now, look at the weekly chart on this one, a little bit different. You can see where the shortages is, and China has been buying lots and lots of soybeans. So you have also a trend line here that you could probably put in with connecting these highs and these highs, that might give you a nice guide. It looks like it might come in at around 19. But we've already taken out the 200 week. We're starting to see the 50 week flip more positive. So this to me, and um, we'll get a better idea when we look at the daily, looks like anywhere down here, down to around 17 is a gift in terms of a buy. Let's get a, a more finite look at it though on the daily chart. Soybeans, here we are. So you can see we're far from the 50. We're still not showing market leadership, but our momentum is declined, but not in any kind of divergence. And here, I would say either I'd be looking for a further dip closer to 17 so I can control my risk down to the 50, or if we can get another move back over, let's say 1780, let's use this high right here, which is 1791. Somewhere between 1780 and 1790 would give you another opportunity. And then you can use the low of this day I'm showing you right now at 1736 as some kind of risk because it does look like soybeans will continue its move up. Now, wheat's been a little bit more challenging because I showed you that soft winter wheat hasn't been as as uh, explosive. This is the daily chart. Let's go over to the weekly chart first. And look at this. I mean, this to me, 
I get excited when I see stuff like this. We've already cleared this 50 week. We have this beautiful basing action here that has happened now. We go back a little bit here into the beginning of 2019 actually. So we've had a two year base on this one. We kind of took out the base here, but we have this 200 week moving average, which we pierced for like a nanosecond and then have come off. If this can get anywhere near that 555, just another 10 cents lower, that would I think be an opportunity. And if we take a look at this on the daily chart, you could see that you would have the 200 day moving average as a nice risk point there if it gets much lower. If it doesn't and it starts to move back up, I would say a close over 575 would also be an opportunity. And then you can use a risk somewhere around the lows that we're having right now, which is around 560. Again, not showing any leadership. And our momentum here is no divergence. It's under the 50, but over the 200, just like price. Okay, a couple of more. This is, again, something I've talked about. And it's not, it's not a crop as far as a food crop. It's a soft commodity. And that is cane, sugar, because sugar really is a good inflationary indicator. I've mentioned this many times through the year. It's above its 50-week. It also had a nice little bottom here after this big crash here during the pandemic scare. And now, again, we can get through these levels. This is starting to start to look interesting, like you can get a move up to eight. If we take a look at the daily on this one, And by the way, we're long sugar as well. We have been for a while. You're getting close to a new buy opportunity with a very tight risk by the 50-day moving average. So I'd be keeping my eye on that. Probably would want to see maybe this flatten out a little bit in terms of its leadership against the benchmark, which right now it's showing it's not. Also here on the real motion, even though the momentum is not horrible, it needs to go back over that Bollinger Band. So you got a little bit of time. And of course, you always have to watch the underlying when you're looking at these any of these ETFs that relate to futures, in this case, sugar futures. But again, I still am long-term very bullish in this one. And two more. The other one, because I wanted you to really have a good full picture here of what to look at as we go into 2021. This is cocoa. This is a cocoa ETF, obviously not the futures, but this also has broken out. This had a a golden cross on its weekly chart. It cleared that 50 week and flew. But of course, you can see here 3435 is a lot of resistance. And of course, this is where I mentioned Hershey before. That's one of the reasons why the Hershey chart has done so well. So if we take a look here on the daily chart, we can get a little bit clearer picture. It's not a heavily traded ETF, by the way. But nonetheless, we're back under the 10. We're in a bullish phase. We're getting some consolidation. We're still outperforming here. So we want to see that hold. We want to see the real motion hold. And with some support now down here at around 3130, I would say if it can get back up over these highs right here, Let's take a better look at it, like 3260. Then you have the 10 day moving average, but we don't know where that will be by the time that happens, not that far. That also could mean inflationary number one, but also an opportunity there. And the last one I'm gonna show you here is coffee, because I mentioned about drought conditions in Brazil, which is the biggest coffee region. Now, JO, again, the underlying to the coffee futures at KC, is showing a nice correction here, and it's been a little bit choppy. And all we have is a 50-day moving average because this thing hasn't been around that long. But we are trying to hold around this 3450 level. This is one where I definitely know I'll be able to give you a better idea as we look on the daily chart because we are also long a small position looking to add in JO. So with JO, you're still in an accumulation phase because the 50 is under the 200, but we're dancing around this 200 day moving average. So this 3411 continues to need to hold. The momentum looks good still. Actually, the momentum looks very good. It's actually outperforming a little bit here in terms of the price, but the market leadership has started to wane. So what we wanna see in futures, by the way, would be a close over 120. It's trading right now at 117.50. That would mean that this would need a close over 35.50. We get a close over 35.50. Obviously, we have some work to do. We have to clear most recent highs that we had up here at 36.68. But if we can get through that, 
then we can actually maybe see a big move. And especially if that drought takes hold and La Nina really, really gets her grips into those drying regions, then we might see an explosion there as well. So there you go. My theme for 2020 has been watching the turnaround in the food and the softs and going into 2021. I think that's really going to be the best opportunity in terms of commodities. And of course, that will then in turn roll over to other inflation indicators like gold, which has been lagging uh, lately against uh, what we're seeing here in terms of steel and copper. Okay, I hope that was helpful to you. Thank you so much. I wish you all a very happy holiday, and I look forward to being with you all in the new year. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.